It is Friday, September 17th, 2021. I want to welcome you all into Coronavirus Inside the Arizona Numbers, where we take a closer look at the numbers here in our state to help you make the best decisions for your family and your life. Uh, a lot to get to today, Garrett, but but the 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 overarching theme here, we are in, if, uh, if you travel in Arizona, we are the sunset point of coronavirus right now. We are in this plateau. The good news is it's not uh, skyrocketing. The bad news is it's not dropping off. But boy, these numbers each day, you and I sit in the newsroom and talk about it. And, and it's like every day that reinforces this, uh, this plateau that we're in. Yeah. The thing about being in a plateau is uh, the, the it's, it's good news right now because it's about, you know, 25 to uh, I think it's about 50 percent of the cases we had. It's, it's close to what we were yeah. in the summertime. But um, the problem is, is obviously the longer that a plateau we sustains itself, yeah. the more it starts to have the same amount of people as the winter surge anyway. So uh, that's one of the things we have to look at is like, OK, we are in a plateau. Yeah, uh, we have been for about three weeks now. But um, how long is it going to last? Uh, so, and is it going to so be a gradual decline or is it going to start going back up? Right now, the plateau we're looking at isn't really increasing. It's mm -hmm. just going down very slowly. Yeah. So you're you're going to kind of keep a closer eye on the numbers just for perspective in that whether we see that that whole peak come Correct. compared to January or our winter surge. Correct. Because okay. uh, as, as I stated, like with a, with a plateau, you know, right now it's good news that our numbers aren't increasing any longer. But if we remain in a plateau uh, you know, up until, you know, December, uh, you know, two months from now, you know, and we're still tacking on 20,000 cases a week, which is about what we're tacking on, uh, you know, that eventually gets to where it, it encompasses the entire winter surge. Now I know people will, you know, remark something about, uh, hospitalizations not being a problem, mm -hmm. but remember that the numbers we're looking at are still, they still track. We've even in this plateau, we've still seen the hospitalizations track with the case numbers. So that means yeah. that, as these number these case numbers stay, you know, somewhat inflated, so will the hospitalizations, uh, and so will the deaths. And this is a concern for hospitals. I, I did a, a press conference with Banner this week, uh, in which they, you know, talked about how they have to hire some more staff to just make sure that they're going to get through the winter and the fall because COVID is they expect COVID to continue and slightly increase in their bed capacity, but hospitals are traditionally more full during uh the fall and the winter right. and so they 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 still have to deal with their non-covid patients right now they told me that in banner's case and, and likely in everyone else's that covid is the uh uh when you when you take all the categories of what people are in the hospital for covid is by far the largest single category of why people are in the hospital yeah. um and so that that's their concern covid is a very intensive thing for their staff uh, it takes more staff to take care of them and, and so they're just they're concerned that this is going to continue for two to three months because you know i said again they they have to deal with the rest of the capacity in the hospital as well Okay, so one thing I want to address, not to be distracted as, as we're talking here, Garrett, but the comments are uh, wild right now. So I just want to remind as folks that, that, um, that we are here to talk about the numbers and the numbers coming out of the state of Arizona. If you're looking for information on anything else and treatments, you need to go talk to your primary care physician. Um, that is not what we're discussing here today, but um, simply taking a closer look at the numbers. So uh, first of all, let's go through the numbers and we'll try to stay on track. I might have to even turn the comments off for a bit. Um, but Garrett, let's look at today's numbers and then let's help people put it in perspective for the week over week, because sure. I think that can help illustrate um, where we're seeing a plateau and then why that's concerning and why that's not concerning. So so today's numbers coming out specifically here in Arizona, we'll do that through the AZDHS site. Yes. Okay. So today's numbers. And we'll talk about Pfizer. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, 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 we'll, about Pfizer. We'll, co we'll come back to that. I see. I see your comment, Alex. I'll get, I'll get uh, there. 2,830 cases today. Uh, this is the sixth day. Um, I'm looking right now just to make sure. This is the sixth day, yes, that we have had under 3,000 cases. And really, there was only one other day uh, in the last 12 days in which we were over 3,000 cases. And so basically, if you look at you know, where we are with this number, this 19 death number, it's it's fairly low, but the deaths tend to fluctuate a lot in reported numbers from day to day uh and so we still are about we're averaging about 30 deaths uh being added to uh arizona's death count every day um and uh our, so this is what our, our 
numbers are right now. Let me go to the cases and show you what I mean by this plateau. So first things first, um, as soon as this loads, uh, obviously this is a pretty crazy uh, curve here. This is the entirety of the curve. Uh, and, and this is cases by day. So this is when the actual case happened. Uh, and we're going to move this to week long, weekly. And here you go. So you can see, let, let's look at the patterns in the other surges. So back in the summertime of last year, cases shot up very quickly within a three to four week time frame, and then actually came down very quickly within a three to four week time frame. We see that also in the larger, the much larger surge in the winter time where cases took about six to seven weeks to get to its peak of the pandemic of 66,718 cases in one week. But then as you can see, it dropped considerably after that. It took about five weeks for it to drop to uh, the levels that we saw during most of the spring. Now you can see we had this ramp up here, it took about four to five weeks. And here's our four to five week right here. Uh, and, and you can see 22,830 is the peak of this particular surge on August 15th, the week of August 15th. Uh, and you can see it's only gone down very, very slowly now. It's gone, right now we were we were just, oh, we were just under 20,000, 19,000 cases. Right now we're at 18,206. Uh, this is the lowest percentage change since June. And so as you can see, our numbers while decreasing, it is a very slow process right now. Yeah, uh, a very slow process. And as we look at those numbers as well, Garrett, uh, for those of you who are watching from other counties around Arizona, you can go to the AZDHS site and then click on your county to learn a little bit more information or maybe a county that you're traveling to as well to learn more. I think we uh, passed, sadly, the 11,000 death mark here in uh, Maricopa County. And as we've reported, 19,000, more than 19,000 in, in Arizona overall. Garrett, when we're looking at these hospitals hospitalizations, these numbers, it looks like uh, at last check, we had about more than 950 Arizonans in the hospital at this very moment. Are the numbers still looking about like uh, that? We have, we have about 2,034 in the hospital for COVID-19 right now. Wow. That's what, so this, this curve, just so everyone understands, this curve is self-reported by each hospital. So this is a really good, so <clears throat> in statistics, in reporting, I know people like to say, oh, you know, the government's fudging the numbers or whatever, I, you know, whatever the, the new conspiracy theory, or actually it's kind of quite old conspiracy theory, but whatever the number is. Um, when these are self-reported, uh, that means that it's it's much more difficult for the numbers to be fudged because as I've seen how this works, the AZDHS, no one really touches this. It just goes right on here. So we can really rely on this number as the current hospitalizations. And here you can see we've been in a peak since about August 30, for, uh, like about August 22nd here. We went up a little bit, but really our numbers for inpatient general care COVID-19 have stayed very flat for uh, since for about a month now, really. Um, and then we go to ICU. Uh, we see ICU is a little different. Um, ICU always lags a little more than hospitalizations, uh, inpatient hospitalizations. You can see our peak sort of started uh, on the 5th of September, which makes sense. It usually peaks about seven days after the inpatient peaks. And you can see this one is also uh, very, uh, it's, it's not moving very much. You can see it's, it's, there's a slight increase, but we're only talking, we're talking uh, fractions uh, of, of a percent right now. Most of the movement in the last three days in ICU has been less than, uh, I think today it was two and a half percent, moving a little faster than inpatient, but again, nothing over 10% movement from week to week. Uh, and these other numbers are the same, ventilator use, uh, this one is sort of flattened uh, as well. Uh, this is also uh, one of the most troubling statistics because the higher this goes, the higher the death rate will go because about 50-50% uh, when you go on a ventilator in uh, uh, for COVID-19. Um, and then uh, discharge numbers. This is uh, both deaths and discharges from COVID-19. That's very important to, to let you know is in hospital terminology, discharge simply means that a bed is available. Uh, and you can see this sort of peaked back in uh, August 22nd, August 23rd, 4th. And it's the, 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 the trend line for discharges is going down. Same thing with emergency rooms. Uh, this The trend line for emergency rooms is on the downswing right now uh, in intubations. It looks like, again, similar to the ICU numbers, intubations are uh, sort of flat right now. They're not really trending in any particular direction. So many people are, are asking about vaccinations in the comments, and, and Loretta had just asked, what's the percentage of Arizonans vaccinated? And we can go through some of those specific numbers. I, I believe we're at more than 57%, Garrett, for the first dose so far 
yes. here in Arizona. Um, the other thing that we look at, because some are a one dose and some are two dose, so we call a complete set or a complete series. Mm -hmm. We're looking at about 51% of Arizonans have gotten the complete Correct. series so far of vaccinations. Uh, we're lucky enough to be able to break down those numbers a little bit further through the CDC's website. They have a really great site, Loretta, for um, for vaccinations that are broken down by age. I had somebody ask me yesterday, um, okay, that's great if we're at 57 or 51%, but it, what percentage does that look like for those who are eligible? So you think we have, what, a million school-aged kids here in Arizona, so break that out by 12 plus and 12 under. So where does that get us and what percentage does that get us? And I found that the CDC or the covid.cdc.gov has kind of a really great look at vaccinations. Now, I had to drill down to the county um, to find that specifically, Garrett, and I chose Maricopa County to sort of look at those percentages. But once I did that, uh, I just felt like it was a really great way to... Um, illustrate to people what those percentages look like. They ha also had over 16 in there too. Correct. So yeah, I'm looking at, um, I might not be looking at the same site. So if I'm not, let me know and I'll find it really quick. Um, let me put it on screen here, Katie, and you can tell me if this is the correct dashboard that you were you were looking at. Uh, is this the one you were looking at? Um, you know what I don't think so because I was able to drill down by county for okay. vaccination. Let me, let me, uh, Let's let me keep. T I'll look for a little longer to find okay. it. I'm sure I'll find it. This is the you know the, the CDC's data tracker. It's it's quite substantial. That's why it just takes me a second to find it. So yeah, no give worries. Me one moment, um, and I'll get that for you. Um, and uh, to Loretta's question, you can also find some of the breakouts for our age groups here in Arizona on AZDHS's site as well. That's got some really great numbers and the success rate of vaccinations for those 65 and older and older Arizonans. It's it's um it's it's great news because so many people are getting vaccinated in that highly vulnerable age group. So hopefully um, we can find that for you and, and get those numbers for you. But overall, once again, 57% of Arizonans have at least one dose and 51% have their full series already done. So we've passed that halfway mark for um, Arizonans. It, it equals out, shakes out to about 3.6 million of the 7.1 million. And it's okay, Garrett, if we don't yep, have I that specific it. number. Yep. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I did. I just found it as we were talking. So let me share my screen. Um, and I believe this, this is looking at Maricopa County vaccinations. Yep. This is um, exactly the site okay. I found. So this is, this is showing just the, what the CDC has for vaccinations here. You can see a uh, percent of the population, at least one dose they have at 54.9. Uh, typically they're always a couple days behind. A so lag, that, that yeah. makes sense. There's a little lag. Um, and also the one we were looking at that 57% is uh all of Arizona, not just Maricopa County. So the number is slightly different. Um, fully vaccinated, 47% in Maricopa County. Population 12, uh, over 12 years of age. You can see uh, that's 64%. So that really, that the way you look at that is that's actually taking out, obviously, the people who are right now ineligible for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So our, our rate out here is closer to 65%, uh, at least one dose. 55% fully vaccinated. So about you know, when, when you really take into consideration that there's a, a, a large population that, that just is not eligible. Um, and of course, uh, the most important number for me uh, always is this one down here, which is the population 65 years of age, 87% uh, having their first dose. So basically one in 10, and then the fully vaccinated is about uh, three and four, three fourths of people 65 plus are fully vaccinated. Very important number because this is the group that is uh, the most vulnerable to COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, we got some questions about um, the news on Pfizer today. As I mentioned, we, we um, are here to cover the numbers, but also some of the news that's happening around the world. And uh, the U.S. is set to buy hundreds of millions of um, Pfizer vaccines. This is to donate to the world. It was one of the things that the World Health Organization was raising as a concern in all of this, that uh, we might move to provide booster shots before everybody around the world had access to the vaccine. And they were saying that that was one of the sticking points and that they didn't feel that that was right. Now, the review happening today at the FDA had all the advisory experts meeting. They actually voted down Pfizer's application for boosters for everyone over the age of 16. So that's what Pfizer was asking for, talking about the waning uh, 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 response of the, the vaccine after about six months. They, so they asked for 16 and older to be able to get this booster. They turned that down. And then later in the day saying 65 plus would be allowed to get the booster. And those with... Um, 
any sort of high risk, increased risk for disease. So that news just coming out this afternoon, the advisory panel meeting pretty much all day today. We expected to vote early this afternoon, and that's the very latest that we're, that we're hearing from that. So once again, votes against the boosters for young adults, but older adults will be getting the green light on this. How and uh, the logistics of how that will happen remain to be seen, especially here in Arizona. I know, Garrett, in New York, they were setting up just in case it went through 16 to get ready to have some of these you know, mass sites open again to be able to get people boosters. That does not look to be the case yet today. Um, when we talk about these these boosters, we do have uh, millions of pe people who have already gone in to get their booster. I know of uh, anecdotally just a couple friends who are in a high risk situation who've been able to go in and already um, get their booster shot. So it is it is already happening. This is just the FDA part of all this. Um, Garrett, the Washington Post grabbed a lot of headlines this weekend when they talked about um, some of the, they kind of put it in a real easy to understand form here with the numbers. And it's something we aim to do each and every week now that we meet with you. We used to meet with you here every single day. But um, when, when we meet each week to help people better understand how these numbers look for survivability of all this. And of course, uh, I say that to say that we know that there are so many long haulers out there and there are other horrible effects of this disease that um, are outside of just survivability. But when you're looking at one death in how many, uh, it's very headline grabbing. I know that the Washington Post had said in Arizona, the way the numbers shake out right now, we have had one death in every 380 people here in Arizona, just some um, crushingly sad numbers, especially if you're close to one of those those one in 380 people who have been lost. There's there's yes. obviously no replacement for that. But if I'm not mistaken, one, two, three, four, that puts us at about the fifth spot, unfortunately, yes. for uh, deaths across the country. What were some of the other key takeaways out of that uh, report coming in this week? So uh, I've got it up right here. Um, but when you look at the, uh, the the Washington Post article, and this, this mm -hmm. is the graph you're talking about, this is yeah. where it takes all of the uh, states and compares them as far as the death rate, the COVID-19 death rate. So you can see in Mississippi, it's killed one in 330 people. Uh, again, Arizona, 380. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to uh, Vermont and Hawaii, which it's uh, one in every 2,100 people. So th this, the other takeaways uh, from that are, are a little farther up. Uh, I'm going to start right here at, say, the age. You know, we already talk about this all the time, but people older than 85 make up 2% of the population, but a quarter of the death toll, one in 35 people 85 or older have died of COVID. So that's, again, very important to know. The, 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 um, this, the COVID is, is so much more deadly to people over 85 than it is for everyone else. You can see 65 to 84, 150, and then 40 to 64 is one over uh, in every 780 people. I know people like to throw around that recovery number, the 99% recovery number or whatever. Uh, yeah, 98 sick they like to put out but the reality yeah. is that when, when you when you break it down to age categories uh that recovery number is now useless so uh and there's many other ways that recovery number is useless but that's just one way it's useless and you can see that right there with the age 85 and older uh and then you can see uh there's some ethnicities as well native americans one in every 240 people uh hispanics one in every 390 uh blacks 480 and then asians and whites at 1300 so you can see where uh in the 40 to 64 year old category uh how that breaks down um these are sort of the the, the numbers that they have with these now um the, the I, i'll just say this once uh, as far as it comes to reporting on uh covid 19 one of the issues with reporting on covid 19 of course is that uh there's no there there are standards in covid-19 reporting but they're they they can vary uh and so a lot of these numbers can vary so like for example in places like Arizona mass you know you've got these 380 390 there can be some fluctuation based on how things are reported Florida for for example only reports these things once a week right mm -hmm. now um and and on top of that every state has different demographics you know Arizona is a retirement state uh and so there is some argument to be made that because we have a larger than our proportion of the population that is over 85 is is a little higher than some of these other states so it's not always just going to be because of mitigation strategies or, or lack of mitigation strategies although that is going to play a major part in it 
uh, that there's so many variables with COVID-19 is, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, and, and making sure that we talk about those. As you mentioned, uh, Florida only reporting on Fridays. We talked about some of the states with limitations yeah. last week. If you missed any of our discussion on that, um, scroll back to last, we weren't with you last Friday, two weeks ago yeah. Friday, and we, we highlighted some of the different rules in different states and how that breaks down because, because it, it, it does play into how the numbers look, and that's why we always try to meet up with you here to help provide some uh, perspective on all of this as well. Garrett, uh, at-home testing. Boy, yeah, well, first that's... of all, I wanted to, there's, there's a, I don't know who's talking to who, but someone in the comments are saying something about people who die from the vaccine within the first 14 days as a COVID-related death. That's that's beyond absurd. Just yeah. absolutely yes. absurd. That 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 that's not even close to remotely accurate. First of all, the the, the death rate from the vaccine is is a fraction. It's so tiny. It's less than one percent. It's it can, I don't even know the number. Is so small. Yeah, um, and, and, and if you and go to, to the, there's a whole reporting message, system yeah. for it. Yeah, there's and, a whole and reporting and, system for it. Exactly, and to, to and to even suggest that that uh, uh, that people are being counted as a COVID related death from vaccines is just absurd. So yeah. I just wanted to throw that out there. It's I, like, I, I don't like seeing that kind of misinformation on the feed. Well, there's a there's a lot of misinformation in there today. Unfortunately, I saw someone else saying, stop saying ERs are overrun. We never said ERs are overrun, but we did show you oh. the exact numbers so you can see how it looks. This is not Idaho. Idaho is in a different situation than we are in Arizona right now. That's why we always present you with the exact numbers coming out of all the hospital systems here so that you can make the best decisions for yourself and your family. There have been points in this uh, pandemic, Garrett, that that they were overrun, though, that that I said to my kids, you know, yes, I don't want were, you doing this, jumping yes. around in the backyard and acting a fool because there's no space for you if you break your arm yes. or do something dumb. There, that there is were not the case period, right now. Yeah, there were sustained periods back in the winter time in which they were diverting ambulance traffic mm -hmm. for a large percentage of hospitals. Now, people will, you know, came, I remember back then people would come back to us and say, well, in flu season, they divert too. Yeah, for maybe a day. That's yeah. the difference is that there are times in flu season or other time where hospitals reach capacity and ambulances must divert. But in, in the winter time, this last it surge, they were constantly diverting. Uh, and it was a, it was large hospitals, Chandler Regional. Uh, and that's the only one that comes to mind at this very moment. But they were large hospitals that mm -hmm. were diverting and they were diverting for a, a sustained period of time. So, yes, our hospitals were very close to being overrun back in the winter time. Now, are we suggesting that they're being overrun now? Absolutely not. I said I, I had that conversation with Banner on a press conference, and and Banner does not. They're not saying their hospitals are overrun. They have a staffing issue that they have to deal with, and they're doing their best to ramp it up. But uh, they're not suggesting that their hospitals are overrun, and the data does not show that our hospitals are overrun. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up too because. Yeah. People are saying things we did not not in any way say. Okay, Tracy's asking about the RT number. Is that still something that's being tracked? Or um, has that sort of, is that less of a, a, a factor for us? And is it publicly released? Yeah, let, let me show you why the RT number is might not be a great metric anymore. And so Tracy, first of all, thank you I'll, for the question, the thoughtful question. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question it because is. obviously there was a time where we were hanging on the RT number. Every day. So, and the governor was too, to be fair, making decisions exactly. for the whole state. So, so first I'm going to show you what the RT number is, or at least a, a there's many ways to calculate the RT number. Uh, they fluctuate within a few points of each other. I'm going to use COVID Act now because that simply is what I have up right now. Uh, our infection rate right now is calculated at 0.94, uh, which means the, it, it, they do believe that the infections in Arizona are shrinking. Uh, that's basically, uh, as we've explained it before with the RT rate, if 100 people had COVID-19, then 94 people are getting COVID from those 100 people and so on and so forth. So that's why they believe that the infection rate is going down in Arizona. Now, uh, that fluctuates from the counties, you can see Maricopa being our largest county is a 0.92. Uh, in, let me just move this like this to see if we have any. We do have some some over ones. We have La Paz, Cochise, Coconino, and Mojave that are all over ones. So basically, the three of our northern counties and one of our southern counties are all over one right now, but only only very slightly over one. Uh, so that means that again, when you when, you're, when your range of counties are from a 1.13 to a 0.8, you're essentially in a plateau. So now. That being said, when we talked about the RT rate, let me show you why there is a chance that it's 
even though we are we are in a confirmed plateau uh, and the RT rate's not moving a lot, there's there's some evidence out there that we have more cases uh, than what our case curve will show us. And that's because in the last several months, uh, at-home testing has become widely available. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm sure some people in our in, you know, who are watching this have attempted to get at-home testing from like a Walgreens or from a Walmart or, or CVS, whatever, and we're unable to find it. I know myself, I wanted to test my daughter when she had the sniffles a couple of weeks ago. She, she ended up, no, but I had to go to like three different Walgreens to try to find to, one. To find a yeah. Binex Now test. So uh, a lot more testing is going on. So yeah. now these tests, these are at home antigen tests. Uh, if you know, if you test positive with an at home antigen test, they do ask you to go and get a diagnostic test. But a lot of people aren't going to do that, especially if they're symptomatic. They take their 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 at home antigen test and then they just quarantine and they don't report the results because these results are not reported to the state. Um, and so it's, what I did was it's I, kind of like how people would back in the day find out they had some anything and just not report it to the yeah, state. And they just it's, deal with it. It's not yeah. high on your mind. Yeah. It's just similar to flu. I mean, we, yeah. we've all yeah. had the flu and no one's going to call up and say, hey, I got like, the flu. I, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm taking care of myself, I got to make sure I call the county health department. Yeah. 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 So so all, all the time. So this is this is what the when I looked at the Google search data for at home COVID tests, which I, I try to simplify it as much as possible. Like if I'm not, you know, not many people know what Binax now is. They're going right. to search for at home. How COVID would test. how would how would the average uh, user of user, this at home test yes. type this in? Type right, this in. To make it more. And so accurate. this is what I came up with right now. You can see what's interesting about this is we were you know in just before the surge we were at essentially a zero for for search queries uh, for at home COVID tests, and then during the surge they ramped up, ramped up. Right now we're at the highest number that uh, Arizona has recorded for people searching for at-home COVID tests. Um, and a lot of these are not gonna be reported. <laughs> so we don't know, you know, and, and that also means that they're, they're not gonna go to the hospital. Uh, but you know, that's, that's one of the interesting things about this particular surge is that there are more variables. There's just going to be a lot more people that are just simply not gonna have their test reported to uh, the Department of Health because they're just gonna take their test from home and uh, take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, this doesn't isn't going to affect the hospitalization curve, as I said, the correlation between the, the cases and the hospitalizations, because um, you know, a lot of times when with, you need a hospital, you need a hospital. When you need a hospital. Yeah. So if you go to the hospital, if you go to the emergency room, you go to the hospital, and you uh, basically give them the list of of symptoms that are COVID, they mark you as COVID probable. Okay, mm -hmm. and then but you are going to get a test. Uh, you know, you will get a, a diagnostic test, not an antigen test, uh, when you go to the hospital. So basically, if when people go to the hospital and they take up a COVID bed and they're marked COVID, it's it's going to be COVID. So those that case curve being at a plateau and the hospital curve being at a plateau should remain tracked for the foreseeable future. Right. Uh, some people were saying, well, if you if you get a vaccine, you can still get sick. Which is true, yeah. but one of the things that we learned after after Delta became dominant is that fully vaccinated people had a reduced risk of infection times 5%, of hospitalization times 10%, and of death times 10%. So of the key important areas here, not, not being in the hospital, suffering, or having a large financial bill that's usually at the median, we looked at $20,000 is what the Kaiser Family Foundation found, and losing your life and leaving your family to pick up the pieces here. So once again, after Delta became dominant, fully vaccinated people had a reduced risk of infection at five times the rate, hospitalization 10 times the rate, and death at 10 times the rate. So while people can argue, especially in the comments, about whether... Um, whether this prevents you from from getting COVID or a mild breakthrough case of COVID or even a, a, a stronger breakthrough case of COVID, what it's truly protecting you from here is financial and emotional and 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 suffering of being in the hospital and then death. Yeah, the the uh, we also did a press conference with Northern Arizona Healthcare, the hospital system that manages the counties in the north of Arizona, mm -hmm. and and they. Uh, on this thing that said their current census for COVID-19 patients uh, was 90% unvaccinated. And they said this is so, not- So say uncommon. this again. So you're saying 90% of the people in the hospital are no, unvaccinated? No, 90% of the COVID-19 patients, patients that are in a hospital are unvaccinated. Right. That's so not 90% of the hospital, but 90% of their COVID-19 group is, so uh, is unvaccinated. 
just uh, just so everybody understands, because we're getting a lot of comments on it, they were saying, can you talk about these breakthrough cases? So there is not a uh, public facing dashboard for us Correct. to relay to you that shows how many are breakthrough cases. What we can tell you is when we meet with hospital leaders and they hold these news conferences for us, they do provide some uh, tidbits of information. And a lot of times yes. they'll even say, there's not one person in the ICU who uh, is is vaccinated. The people who are showing yes. up at the ICU are, are, I mean, usually they're like, we don't even have one. That's every time we've met with them. Yeah. These people do not have a vaccine who are showing up. Yeah, which, which this this is what it, what it boils down to uh, as far as the tidbits we have received from COVID-19 right. uh, from the hospitals and from the Department of Health is that uh, obviously, as we've said, the vaccine uh, is not, it, it, especially if you haven't had COVID before, there's not a lot of data, at least public, about people who have had COVID before and the vaccination. Apparently, that gives you the highest number of, uh, um, you know, percent of immunity. But for people who haven't had COVID and had a vaccine, uh, you know, for the breakthrough rate, uh, you know, yes, you can get sick. That's what they're telling you. Uh, but th the whole point is to not go to the hospital. Yeah. And this thing does not have send people to the hospital. Now, of course, this all had these variables all have to do with age rates and categories. The, you know, there are people who break through in the 60, in the age of 60s and the 70s and the 80s, those people have a much higher chance of going to the hospital if they have a breakthrough case um, than say someone who's in their 20s and 30s. That's you know, uh, that's just the way it works. Yeah, uh, Brant, you're so welcome. Thank you for the comment. I wanna highlight Alex's comment as well. He just uh, so succinctly uh, summed it all up for us. Alex writes, people fundamentally do not understand vaccines. Either they don't want to, or they don't do the research, vaccines work. Just a simple way of um, putting that forward. Maybe Dr. Richard Carmona would like to have you on his team, Alex. He is the new uh, person in charge. Obviously a familiar name to everybody, Garrett being the 17th Surgeon General of the United States, but uh, now residing here. And I believe he's in Tucson. If he's, I believe if he's so. yes. not full time, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, he said as he takes over this new role to, to, to leading the group here, he wants to keep politics separate from pub public health. Uh, you cannot. Be, oh, my gosh. When it's when, a big uh, challenge. Wow. Uh, you cannot get COVID from the vaccine and it does not cause paralysis. Where are you seeing this? Wow. Thing? One of the one of the, the, the comments, someone saying you can get COVID with the vaccine, yeah. too, and it's causing paralysis. The vaccine. Cannot doesn't have, it doesn't have COVID in it. It doesn't so. have COVID. Neither of them. Uh, the, one of them is an mRNA vaccine and the other is a adenovirus, uh, which is basically a dead virus that, that, you know, we all have immunity to because it's such a simple virus. And they put the, the, the antibodies in there and that's how they inject it into your system. That's how you, there, there's no COVID virus. There's, yeah, there's they're not being inoculated. This is not an inoculation. Again, as Alex said, please go. Please go research exactly. Sorry, that was. What that I was is. just like, I that's saw okay. that. Okay, that's dropped. okay. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation in the comments, <laughs> and that's why we're trying to trying to rein it all in again. Um, uh, Seattle taking some steps too. Um, they are requiring proof of vaccination indoor and for large outdoor events. Now, I, I stress that we. Um, cover Arizona and cover the numbers here, but I do want to bring that up because I want to remind folks, I know it's getting closer to fall break and people are thinking about traveling for the holidays. Please go check what the restrictions are in the city you're planning to travel to. We just had an incident at a very popular tourist spot in New York City at Carmine's where a group of people from out of town got into a physical fight with the, the host there, the um, seating tables and letting groups in when they were asked for their vaccination cards. So this this kind of stuff cannot be happening. Uh, so Seattle is now asking for proof of vaccination indoors and for large outdoor events. What is a large outdoor event? They're saying it's 500 plus people. And this is all starting October 25th. So for those of you traveling, please uh, make note of what the rules are in the place that you're headed to because it's, it can be very different from what it is here in Arizona. All right, Garrett, we are quickly running out of time. And I, I really want to get to these um, the prediction numbers. IMHE yeah. has been our go-to place, speaking mm -hmm. of Seattle and, uh, and Washington State. But they have provided us with some excellent and accurate uh, forecasting for how things look and the numbers that we want to look at. Obviously, cases are are interesting in all of this, but the more important numbers, um, hospitalizations and, and, and sadly deaths, because this uh, these numbers that we're going to see over the holidays are, are um, reason to put your mask on and make sure you're vaccinated for sure. And Kimberly, thanks for that sweet comment. Uh, stopping misinformation is critical. It is <laughs> 
It is. <laughs> it is exhausting, my friend, and we, it is we critical. Work, uh, we work for the corrupted government, apparently. <laughs> don't worry. Someone else called us actors, and we haven't been called actors in like over a year. So it was it was funny to see that uh, that that comment. So oh my god, I, I have worked for the government before, uh, but not now. I'm not working yeah. for the government anyway. Sorry, that's, exactly. that's another. Yeah, why? an actor. I've been here at ABC 15 for 25 <laughs> years, 19 on the uh, news anchor desk. So this is it, my friends. This All is right. my <laughs> So uh, University of Washington, uh, this is what they think things are going to look like right now. Okay. Uh, they just updated this on September 15th. Although just looking at this, as you, as you know, Katie, this there hasn't been a lot of changes uh, as far as the direction they think things are going. So this first one is reported COVID deaths. Uh, you can see that there's two projections. One saying 22,000 by the end of January, uh, excuse me, by the beginning of January, uh, and 26,000 as a quote unquote worse number. Uh, and that's basically everybody just walking around with no masks and not getting vaccinated. So uh, that's what they think that, you know, that that's still what, 3,000 more than we have right now, I believe? Yeah. Uh, um, we are as far at 19, as their standard, yes. We're at 19,000 here in Arizona right now. Okay. So, so about, yeah. Yeah, so about about twenty five hundred more right now is, is what they they're saying. Um, when we look at the daily death numbers, uh, it, it this thinks that the projections think we're just going to stay in this plateau for the rest of the of the of the fall and the winter time getting into the winter. This worst case scenario has a spiking during the holidays and then coming back down. But the the other scenario, the projected scenario that they believe is going to happen, uh, is uh, just best, like you said, a plateau. Um, here we are with hospital use. Uh, you can see again that we don't even have the 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 the. If you look at this, there's not even the. It, it doesn't even see the maximum number. It used to have the maximum number, but it doesn't believe we're we're not gonna we're just not gonna get there. But you can see in both cases, it does believe all beds and ICU beds will just same thing with, with uh, what Banner said. Just gonna continue rising slowly, um, and then daily infections and testing. Uh, this one you can see in the worst case scenario, it believes that it's similar to the winter surge. As soon as we get into the holiday season, uh, our numbers would, uh, again, this is estimated infections. Our, our, our numbers can get as high as 26,000, but our current projections are, again, continue with this, uh, uh, this plateau of infections that will just kind of stay constant and continue on until the end of December. It's just sad timing again. You just hate to see all this, the hospitalizations and and uh, loss of life over Correct. the holidays. We yeah. experience, we, you and I could see the numbers last year at the same time and, and, and see that rise. I know this is a, a bit different, a plateau, but a loss is a loss and, and, and there's no great time to lose someone you love, but especially during the holidays. And recovery. Yeah, and, and, and again, the, the problem with that is if you take all that time and yeah. you compact it, it, it becomes about the same size as the winter surge. It's just mm -hmm. overextended a period of a longer period of time. So, you know, we all want to see these numbers go down. They just right now, there's we're, we're going down ever so tiny, but yeah. really it is ever so tiny. So it's it, it could flip on a dime and start going back up. Now, when it goes back up, it, it will likely stay in this what this projection says, where it's just going to go up a little bit, yeah. and it might do this for a little bit. You know, I that's that's what it seems to be suggesting right now that we won't see these large spikes or declines right now. But again, yeah. we'll see. You, know, you never know. That's We, we so, have to watch these numbers daily. Uh, so because because we watch these numbers daily, and sometimes, Garrett, there can be some anomalies in the reporting, as we saw over Labor Day, and it, mm -hmm. it is to be expected. It's something we walk everybody through. This is, this is coming your way. But is it then best to sort of look at, at the weekly numbers so you can smooth yeah. out any anomalies? I mean, I'd, I'd hate to see... Uh, somebody look at the numbers in Florida on a Friday and think, oh my gosh, you yeah. know, I'm never going to do anything outside of my house again, because that's, that, that's just a, a, a function of their reporting there. But if you didn't know the rules around it, it could be jarring. So I here, mean, if you go to, to yeah, week, well, if you, there's two ways to do it, week to week is a very stable way of looking at the numbers, mm -hmm. but the other way, but always remember when you look at a week to week number, always slash off the most recent week because the reporting hasn't been completed for that week. The other way of looking at it is the seven day average. And you can find that um, AZDHS does not have a seven-day average, but you can find that on uh, John Hopkins, 91 DVOC, COVID Act Now, basically in New York Times, Washington Post, almost everybody has a seven-day average. The reason seven-day averages are so good is it does do a very good job smoothing out things like weekend reporting. The only time it really uh, fails is during extended 
holidays, which we only have two in the United States or in, in, in the world, well, in the US, uh, Thanksgiving holiday and Christmas season is when the even the, the seven day average sort of fails because we just, you know, people because there's are off too much for like in there. Week. Yeah, it's just yeah. too much. But aside from that, uh, not, uh, seven day averages do a great job of pretty much smoothing out most of the, the, the weekends and, and, you know, Monday holidays we have every once in a while. So it's it's good to look at that. Yeah. So Deanna is asking, is our RT number really under one? No, so yes, it is. It's under it one is. because we're in a plateau. So it's good yeah. news and bad news, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's going down Deanna. slightly 0.94 and uh, it's, it's going to keep you know, right now. It looks like that's going to be our sort of reality is yeah. that it's going to go down slowly. And then maybe next week it's going to change to 1.05 or something. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's going to fluctuate in this right little in area. But right again, in. that's, that's what the, that's what the, uh, uh, this, um, forecasting believes and uh you know we'll, we'll see how how correct it is yeah all right uh we're kind of running out of time here i want to um uh, thank you for all the kind words we're saying all the the thanks in there deanna you're welcome uh joe thank you i appreciate the constant commitment to accurate information thank you we so appreciate comments like that um we just want to help you make the best decisions for your family and your life and so that um you can stay healthy and stay safe and and spend your money on other things. Do not spend your money on a hospital stay. Let, let's keep you out of that, out of that all together. Um, so Garrett, okay, where can we find Garrett? Well, first of all, I see uh, producer Carrie, thank you, has uh, punched this up. abc15.com forward slash coronavirus. If you have more questions about Pfizer's decision today, we've posted some of the stories there. We'll of course be covering that in our evening newscast coming up in just about an hour or so at four, five, six. Uh, nine over on CW61 and also 10 p.m. So we'll continue to cover uh, this throughout the day and what comes next with this FDA decision. Then we will also have places where you can find us. Garrett is on Twitter, bravely so. No oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> at Garrett <laughs> underscore Archer. Garrett is assigned to all things numbers at the station. And there's uh, um, some uh, noteworthy numbers coming out next week on other topics. And so yes. uh, Garrett's Twitter account, please uh Tread carefully over there. Uh, at Garrett underscore Archer is where you can find him. You can also find uh, me at Katie Rammel. If uh, all of you are watching on Facebook and that's easier for you right now, facebook.com forward slash news from Katie is the best place to uh, find me. I'm just laughing at Kathy's comment. You're my favorite actors. <laughs> Good work. Oh, Kathy, thank you. Uh, Arizona schools updates. So we didn't really get a chance to touch on this more. We'll try to talk about it in the upcoming sessions, but you can find your very latest schools report at abc15.com forward slash schools. Also, as I always say, get in contact with your child's school, your grandchild's school or their school district so that you know you can bookmark that dashboard and have it in your phone to always know what's happening with the latest COVID numbers there at their school. Oh, is there anything else that I missed? Garrett's bow tie needs a Twitter account. I agree. That would be awesome. That would be a great thing. Uh, the count is your screen picture. So that would be he perfect. Behind me. He's, he's hanging out there. He, he missed you when you were at home for all those uh, months. <laughs> so he's probably ha happy to have you back. I, I fed him while you were gone. Oh, thank All right. You. So, so that's where you can find us. We'll be back with you soon. In the meantime, stay safe out there, everybody.